Welcome to Robotics and Automation News Webinars, where you can be part of a global event without leaving your home or office. Attend our live webinars and communicate directly with influential professionals in your industry. Hello, my name is Abdul Montukim. I'm editor of roboticsandautomationnews.com. In this interview, I speak to Sven Alnafu, Director of Business Consulting at Blue Ridge Global. For people like myself who might find it difficult to understand abstract concepts in conversations about software and artificial intelligence, the finer points of what Blue Ridge does may be difficult to figure out. But essentially, it's an AI-driven application that collates large amounts of data, or big data, about supply chains and sales, and then predicts what a company needs to stock in the future, and helps determine the prices of those products. Here's a short explainer video before the interview proper with Sven. Did you know the average distributor is sitting on a $1.25 for every dollar they sell? If you think this is just a causality of business, check out price optimization, a science-driven solution that helps you free up massive amounts of cash right now. Price optimization is a next-gen approach that uses science and simulation tools with supply planning to create the perfect forecast. The system breaks down costly walls between what goes on at a supplier, what sales believes will sell, and what actually does sell. It allows you to write price items across huge assortments, locations, and channels, and deplete inventory at peak margin. It works like this. Something causes demand for an item to spike. You order more. You gotta fill the truck, so you end up with other items you probably won't sell. A price drop will get rid of the excess, but it will also get rid of margin. In another scenario, maybe you didn't order enough. The realist in you says raise the price, but you don't know how customers will react. Blue Ridge price optimization takes the what ifs out of all of this. What if those clearance items actually had demand, but were just overpriced? What if you could understand competitors' prices, segment prices by willingness to pay, and walk into a supplier knowing your max profit point. With price optimization, you can. Now different areas of your business that used to work in isolation can quickly sync on the optimal profitability price to proactively shape demand and create value at scale. We're not talking one plus one equals three here. The value multiplier is actually 30. Here's the real power of SCP plus price optimization. Just a 1% drop in inventory cost can improve profits 12%, while a 1% improvement in price can increase profits an additional 18% for a total of 30. A 30% gross profit improvement certainly makes up for that 25% in dead inventory. Ready to break down walls and start shaping demand through price optimization and SCP? The perfect forecast starts with Blue Ridge. My name is Sven Alnapu. I'm the director of uh, business consulting at Blue Ridge Global. Uh, my responsibilities to date is uh, really supporting the sales organization um, as we take our products out to market. That's through demonstrations, um, often a lot of discovery, um, etc. Prior to this role, I played the role of uh, director of um, Lifeline Consulting, which is a, a special uh, customer support consulting service that we uh, that we supply to our customers as a part of their subscription. Right. And uh, what is uh, Blue Ridge uh, Global for uh, those of us who don't know? Is it Blue Ridge Global or Blue Ridge on its own? What's the uh, company name and what is it? You know, I, I, you know, uh, uh, officially, if you if you look on the legal papers, it's it's Blue Ridge Global. But you know, both our customers and we uh, really just refer to ourselves as Blue Ridge. Right. And what does it do? Um, we are a um, inventory optimization solution for wholesalers and retailers, uh, really focusing on. Uh, data analytics uh, and the you know the auto generation of purchase orders, work orders through forecasting and uh, and and as I mentioned, inventory optimization. Right. 
there's a, uh, there's a, it's, it's a, it's a growing field, isn't it? There's a lot of interest in this type of uh, company and this type of service, uh, supply chain automation and the uh, corresponding price optimization, which are the two key things, I suppose, in in your line of work, uh, automating the supply chain as well as uh, uh, determining the price of, of things. But uh, elaborate, if you could explain and elaborate on those two um, themes, if you, if you don't mind. Sure, no, no problem at all. Um, with the inventory optimization, that, that's actually been, you know, quite a hot topic for a number of years, but most recently because of, you know, the pandemic that we're dealing with. Um, so, you know, a lot of organizations are really uh, very, very interested in how they might go ahead and avoid some of the, you know, some of the problems that they faced when this first came about. Um, and, and really what we're talking about in the inventory optimization is, is really being able to, uh, create accurate, uh, detailed forecasts, you know, um, automatically, um, being able to identify demand patterns, uh, being able to go ahead and identify and apply, uh, you know, seasonality to items, demand cleansing, and as I mentioned earlier, that uh, PO and work order generation. Now, that all really is about uh, bringing in the right amount of inventory. Um, and obviously that's of great concern to both manufacturers and to wholesalers today. The other side of the business, um, and this is something that really has uh, come to a head, if you will, within probably the last year and a half, two years, and that is price optimization. and. And that really derived from, you know, people asking, you know, does demand drive price or does price drive demand? And the answer is yes, <laughs> it does. There are so many different factors, causal factors that um, that affect what the price should be. Um, competitiveness in the marketplace, availability of product. Um, and what we've found is by providing a solution to organizations who really don't have a good idea of what their product should be priced, we're able to go ahead and really facilitate their revenue generation. Yeah, this reminds me, some of the things that you're talking about reminds me of a conversation I had with a, a supplier of uh, autonomous mobile robots, which, uh, the, you know, the um, small little robot sort of look like boxes with wheels. Uh, they have shelf units on the back. And one of the things they told me was that um, their robots were able to or capable of moving products that don't sell as fast to the back of the warehouse, further away from the order um, produ producing or the picking station, as they call it, the human being who stands there and creates orders and mm -hmm. the robots can put the products that move faster sell faster closer to the uh, human picker so it makes sense that uh, you know the, the ones that sell fastest are going to be closer to the human picker and that's something that they do as part of their uh, service uh, the hardware service but it is a software uh, thing so software development technology if you like uh, so that, I don't know if that has sort of resonance with you in terms of what you what you're talking about in terms of uh, uh, seasonal products. Some products may sell at certain certain in certain months and uh, not so well in other months. Is that is that something that I'm sort of making a reasonable connection with? Yeah, yeah, you are because you know uh, items are going to be I, items aren't necessarily slow all of the time, right? You're going to have some items that do have very slow demand um, or very low demand. Um, however, there are characteristics around that. If there is seasonality involved, then yeah, part of the year they probably want to be further away from the from the pick areas. Um, whereas other parts of the year you want to bring them forward. Uh, you know, something else that you want to go ahead and consider is 
you know, items that are very slow moving, but have um, very erratic demand. And in other words, they're slow um, by nature of the fact that they're rarely ordered, but when they are ordered, there are spikes in demand. So for something like that, that's a different type of automation. That would be a forecast automation where you would wanna be able to, you know, generate a forecast for that, what we refer to as long tail demand. But really all, all of this, to your point with the robots and with what I'm talking about really has to do with what we're seeing right now in, 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 in terms of digitization and, and data is the heart of digi uh, excuse me digitization um mckenzie actually just uh just came out and 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 made a uh a comment that analytics and artificial intelligence what you and i are talking about now are expected to deliver between nine and a half and a, in and i think about 15 trillion in ag in annual economic value so the robots that are moving the product back automatically for terms or, or for efficiency purposes, the forecast, the seasonality that's helping those robots to go ahead and do that, all of that is driving towards that annual economic value that McKinsey's talking about. Right, let me try and understand your uh, customer base and, and who you supply to. That may help me to understand your business a bit better. So you, do you supply, do, do, is your software mainly used by uh, manufacturers or, or big companies which have their own supply chains or, or is it uh, third party logistics companies or, or, or um, you know, logistics uh, only kind of companies? What kind of, what kind of customer base do you have? Uh, the, the customer that we base is, is really very, very widespread. Certainly we're, uh, we're implemented in helping wholesaler distributors with, um, you know, in some cases, very complex distribution networks where we're, we're looking at uh, multi-echelon environments. Uh, other customers that we have are actually smaller organizations with single DCs. Um, we are dealing with manufacturers in addition, um, basically being able to provide, you know, automation to the discrete manufacturing side of the business. So when you ask who are you doing business with, it's really anybody that, you know, is, uh, is stocking inventory and shipping inventory to a customer with that customer being defined as either, you know, in the case of a manufacturer, a distributor, or a distributor looking to go ahead and uh, distribute product to uh, a brick and mortar organization, uh, 3PLs, et cetera. All right, I'm looking at this uh, planning and pricing um, page on the website. It's intriguing because, to me anyway, it, because there's a lot of data involved in this kind of um, technology, I imagine. So you, you're going to need lots of data to be input um, in order to plan things and price things. I mean, how does it how, how does it uh, work on a on a basic level? Well, are you talking about uh, how are you getting the the data in, or how does this how do the solutions work? Well, the, the, they're both really, uh, the data input, um, I'm, I, I can probably guess at one or two ideas and where do, you, where, do you, where do you get the data and what kind of data do you need? Is, is it uh, how much people are buying things at and what point uh, does that data transfer into the system, as it were? Sure. Um... Well, the data that's required um, is, is really very similar in, in both solutions. Um, certainly, um, demand is something that is required. So whether we're looking at ship demand out of a distribution center or we're looking at POS coming uh, you know, up from a retail uh, organization, it's very important that we do get that demand. Um, there is a lot of data that is being used and, and really in, in most cases, a majority of that information is coming from 
the ERP solutions that we are interfacing with. So, um, you know, that that's really one of the things that we also see is that a lot of ERP solutions now are looking to organizations like Blue Ridge to go ahead and help them uh, to become much deeper because, you know, historically they've been very wide, but not very deep. And, and the whole inventory optimization and pricing optimization, optimization aspect is something that, um, you know, ERP solutions have identified as being paramount going forward. Right. That's the data input. Now, how does the uh, pricing part of it work? Is it a case of um, uh, the more demand, the more the price goes up and, or, or it's a classic economic or model of demand supply thing or I mean the seasonal aspect might uh, affect it or what, what is the what are the determining factors of pricing? Sure the, with the with the pricing there's there's really a, a lot of causal factors that are being looked at. It's not just simply the demand that's coming in and whether it's seasonal or not. Um, but it really uh, looks to go ahead and look, uh, you know, to, to understand, you know, what are prices with competitors um, based off of the demand? Does it make sense to go ahead and either increase or decrease the price for a period of time and then bump it up later on down the down the road? Um, so really what we are looking at is not just demand. Um, but the rate of demand, the seasonality of demand, causal factors to that demand, and then also the competitive marketplace, anywhere where we can go ahead and get information on how our customer, or excuse me, how our competition is selling the product is something that we want to incorporate and have as a part of our pricing strategy. Mm. This is very interesting. So this is an illustration that I think uh, even people like me can understand uh, where you, if you have overstock too much uh, of a product uh, for a certain amount of time that's not maybe selling um, and you have uh, uh, this one, I'm not sure that means uh, in, inventory down 27%, but that's a kind of... Uh, uh, benefit that people, your customers will be looking for to to sure. be able to um, yeah, it, it manage their inventory in a way that the stocks aren't on the shelves for too long and uh, some, some products are always available even if they're popular and that's the sort of thing that you do essentially, isn't it? Yeah, it, it absolutely is. I mean when you're looking at overstocks and inventory, uh, you know, what a lot of organizations, you know, are considering um, are things such as lead time inventory, safety stock inventory, et cetera, but they're doing it at a very, very high level. And um, there really isn't typically a lot of sophistication um, applied to those, you know, two individual comp components of inventory. Um, with uh, with our Blue Ridge solution, we're talking about actually, you know, forecasting the lead time, not just using a static lead time, and and then even in the calculation of safety stock, uh, it's incredibly robust, looking at multiple components to really understand what that true safety stock need is. And that's where we typically find a lot of reduction in the inventory is that companies typically apply significant amount of, uh, of inventory towards that safety stock. And more often than not, they really don't need to. Yeah, just going back to the, my earlier question about the data being input. Then it has to obviously the data then has to be processed and and decisions made. Now, mm -hmm. that's a, a form of artificial intelligence, isn't it? And and how does that work? Well, the um, the, the the data obviously brought in, and we're talking um, as mentioned earlier, we're, we're really talking about demand. That is really the driver of everything. Um, what what we do within our solution is we do have a number of forecasting algorithms that are applied to the items, but where the AI comes into play is 
being able to go ahead and do uh, a regressive analysis on the demand that has occurred and applying it to each of the forecast algorithms that are out there. Um, by doing that automatically, we can identify you know, what forecast algorithm actually has the lowest forecast error and then automatically assign that forecast to the item so that the user doesn't have to you know, have a statistics degree any longer to determine really what type of forecasting algorithm should they use. That's something that's taken you know, into consideration is applied automatically. That's just one form of the AI that's available. Very interesting that you say that. Thanks for uh, giving me an idea for another question. So what was done before? These uh, statisticians would, would be there trying to figure out uh, the, the um, demand or forecasted demand. What, what was happening before this kind well, of you know, you know, um, you know, it, I'm, I'm chuckling because they weren't statisticians, um, you know, in in uh, in in most cases, you'd have very, very good, uh, you know, I mean, individuals that were very good at at, at replenishing um, just based off of their, you know, the tribal knowledge that that they had. But when it came to offering those multiple or those different multi, uh, forecasting algorithms, um, more often than not, they they really didn't know which ones to select, and they would they would kind of always revert to the way that they had always done thing. So it it's really it's really been kind of an evolution, not only in the systems, but in the types of buyers that we have out there. Now you have universities offering degrees in, you know, supply chain management and, you know, the, the, the people coming out have a much better understanding of what the statistical uh, algorithms are and what the benefits of one over another are. So it's, it's been a very real evolution, not only in solutions, but in people as well. And uh, what kind of benefits, just to elaborate on that point, do companies see typically when they apply this kind of uh, uh, algorithmic approach, if I can call it that, towards uh, managing their supply chain? Um, are you asking what are what what the benefits of that are? Yeah, I mean, um, just saying that I would imagine things are uh, more efficient now as a result of software yep. like this in a typical in a typical supply chain or uh, I don't know if it, if it applies to single warehouses or or whatever no, it, it does means. it does it does it okay yeah yeah, yeah the, so so the benefits are absolutely from an efficiency standpoint without a doubt um, you know typically when you're dealing with people who are involved in uh, in procurement, there's so much that they're responsible for the the typical you know comment is that they can't get enough done in a day so the efficiencies do, do help them to really get through um focus more on value oriented tasks that's that's just one side of it but the other advantage really is truly in forecast accuracy. I had mentioned earlier about that best fit selection of forecast algorithms. By reducing that forecast error, we, we actually start to come out with more accurate forecasts. Those more accurate forecasts lend themselves to more accurate procurement orders that are being placed, uh, more accurate calculations for safety stocks since the forecast is a is a driving uh, metric within safety stock uh, it just really means uh, for the for the for the manufacturer as well as for the wholesaler it means having the right product at the right time and in a multi-location environment at the right location that's really interesting I like uh, to think of things in uh, in my own sort of small world uh, or apply or relate it to my own small world where I go shopping and go to the supermarket or grocery store 
Yes. Uh, often the, the product I want is not available and it's, uh, I don't know, irritating, I suppose. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a, it, it, that kind of thing, obviously on a much larger scale would be a, a bad for that particular business. If like thousands of other people like me are, are not able to buy what the product that they want, um, obviously that company is missing out. Uh, I'm looking at this page uh, and I think these are people that you or your customers, Blue Ridge customers, and it's a very interesting mix of, of businesses, automotive aftermarket sector, HVAC uh, and plumbing, furniture, food service, food distribution, wines and spirits, hardware, electrical, pet, uh, pet, and, pet food and supplies, and there's a number of other industries uh, mm -hmm. that you've mentioned as well. It's a very interesting mix. Who are you, what kind of um, businesses are you dealing with now yourself? What kind of uh, uh, customers are currently in your mind uppermost? You don't have to mention them necessarily because obviously you might have uh, confidentiality agreements with them that uh, you may have cleared with these, but not with the ones that you're talking about. Uh, but you know, on a broader anonymized level, what, what, can, what are you preoccupied with at the moment? Um, I, I really most recently have been preoccupied with um, probably every single one of these verticals that you're looking at, um, but really specifically, I think uh, wine and service, uh, food service organizations, and the um, HVAC industry, those are the three big ones that um, have been taking up a lot of my time as of late. Um, and and really, it, it's interesting to or, or, or a correlation that I'd like to go ahead and make is that or a connection I'd like to make is that it all really has been driven off of, you know, the pandemic that we're dealing with these organizations, wine and spirits, food service, HVAC um, have all been affected dramatically by the pandemic um, HVAC actually has been um, having issues not so much from a, from the demand side but from product availability on the manufacturing side so um, you know these organizations are really looking how can we how can we become more efficient both for our organization but then also how can we collaborate more efficiently with our suppliers to make sure that they know what we need and that's one of the big moves that i see uh seeing the same thing in in food service and in uh in wine and spirits all right yeah it's a, it's it's a complex business if you if you think about it from the point of view of uh, uh when i look to think about it the data that you get in and try and forecast from that um uh, complex as in it would be difficult for well, humans to do, and I imagine that it's because of the advent of computers and uh, data analysis, quite big data as they used to call it, yep. um, and being able to use apply alg algorithms to predict, essentially forecast, as you say, uh, what products are going to be needed and when, and that that kind of developing something like that takes time. Uh, developing that database and that ability to forecast takes time. Uh, how long have you, has your business been in operation, Blue Ridge been, been in operation? And how, how um, established is this type of supply chain automation and, and data analysis in, in, I don't know if you can call it logistics, but uh, how, how new is this field and how much more can it develop? and and uh, get better as it were yeah you know the, the the field uh you know a lot of the initial algorithms that we were talking about really were adapted adapted to uh inventory management um in the late 60s i mean it's as long ago as that it it's really um the whole automation the whole um Trying to look for the right word for the the the, the 
the, the the automation and the advancements that have been made in identifying uh, season seasonal movement to, to identify you know pattern matching all of that has been really probably within the last 20 years um, Blue Ridge as an organization has been around for about 13 years um, but then you know all all of the all of the you know people within our organization we've been involved in inventory uh, management and inventory optimization, you know, for, for much longer than that. So um, it has been around for a while. It's not that new. The artificial intelligence, that's really what's driving the, um, the excitement within the industry right now. And um, as far as where can it still go, um, I don't think everybody really knows for sure where it can go because just the opportunities are, you know, limitless yeah i'm just looking at this um part of the website where it says blue region maintains a raving fan base of customers from 50 million dollars to two billion dollars that's yep. a sort of a level of business we're talking about it's i mean obviously logistics and supply chain is a massive uh, sector and yeah the efficiencies that you can gain from so much of it will, will run into the billions, I, I would imagine, on an, in the aggregate. So, yeah, well, and I, I wanted to talk about the, or ask you to elaborate on what you're saying about coronavirus and the pandemic, which uh, mm -hmm. obviously all of us are affected by and, and uh, suffering from to varying degrees, and I hope it comes to an end soon. Um, but what has been the uh, effect? I mean, one of the things that I've read is that uh, obviously more people are uh, ordering things from home. So online shopping is, is uh, it was already quite big before, but it's just astronomical now. And I guess that makes your kind of software, your kind of company uh, more central than even than, uh, uh, than before. It, it, it does. Um... One of the things that, you know, fortunately we were already working on before the pandemic hit was the ability to, you know, take all of the different, you know, forecasting algorithms and the seasonality applications and the order build capabilities and really apply them to the different channels that are out there. So, you know, one of the things that we are able to do is to help our customers understand not just what their total demand is, but really where is the demand coming in and, and help them to go ahead and manage that demand. So, you know, in other words, if we're looking at e-commerce versus, you know, something that is uh, more retail or wholesale oriented, you need to understand that and you need to be able to have product available for those channels as well. Right. Yeah, these are, these are very interesting areas. Data science, as you say, or AI, um, has really come on in leaps and bounds over the last, uh, well, about five years. I'm not really sure why that is. I think it's the cheapness of computing. There's uh, very large companies around now that provide uh, massive cloud database, uh, cloud computing sort of platforms. Uh, on which AI can run because it uses so much data um, and so on. And uh, yeah, this is a, yeah, this kind of thing would, would be, is it, are there examples of people who are doing, companies that are doing it the old fashioned way that are yet to catch up? I mean, what, what happens in companies that don't use uh, these kind of advanced techniques to manage their inventory? Well, what, what's the, uh, I mean, it's, it feels like it's kind of inevitable that they'll move into this and it might not even exist. I mean, what's the old fashioned way of doing things if you don't, uh, if, if you know what I mean? Oh yeah, I mean, believe me, there are definitely organizations out there that are doing very well. Um, and I almost want to say they're doing very well despite themselves. And what I mean is not so much despite themselves, but they could be doing even better. And they are still using some of the um, some of the more, you know, quote unquote, old fashioned methods. Um, believe it or not, I'm working with organizations or I have worked with organizations recently that 
you know, are still using what we refer to as green bar reports. I mean, it's still Excel generated uh, reports that are looking at inventory and and they're looking at, you know, things such as the the last three months of average inventory projected towards the, the future three months. And it really, you know, doesn't doesn't work well when we're trying to look at pattern recognition. So so typically these organizations, when they're when they're coming to us, um, really what they're saying right off the bat is that they want to be more nimble. Now, being more, more nimble, uh, when you start to investigate, when you start to dig into that, um, they want to be able to respond to the ever-changing uh, inventory needs. So what we need today is not going to be the same as we need tomorrow and may and will not be the same as we need a year from now and it may go up or down based off of the you know the pattern of demand but they want to be able to react very very quickly to these changes in demand and they want to be able to go we can adjust inventory levels accordingly um if you if you ask what are they looking to do typically um at a very high level they're looking to really right size the inventory. I don't want to say they want to reduce inventory. They want to right size it. Um, they're looking to improve their uh, service level attainment to their customers. And then they're also looking to reduce any excess costs that they might have within the solution. So for example, one of the, one of the benefits of right sizing the inventory is obviously making sure that, um, you know, we're not we're not paying too much in acquisition costs and we're not paying too much in carrying costs. Both of those really are driven by how we buy and how we stock. So they're looking to go ahead and improve that as well. The, uh, the, the customers who are using the, uh, the old fashioned means um, are very, very keen to move into today. All right. Okay, and, and this is something, uh, it, although it's new, it's probably spread very quickly. It's, it's been adopted by many different businesses, and, and it does seem to be a very uh, fast-growing market over the last few couple of years, and it is because of, uh, as we talked about, um, more computing power and artificial intelligence mm -hmm. being available, more available, but... Uh, it's still a, a, a relatively new market, and your company, Blue Ridge, must be one of the uh, uh, you know early early uh, not adopters but suppliers, I suppose. Um, what what's the market like in terms of uh, you know your business? How what the growth potential is, and and uh, the competitive landscape? What, what can you say about that? Um. I think it's certainly more competitive today than it was 10 years ago, uh, without a doubt. Um, our our competition is getting more sophisticated, um, and it you know that and the fact that our our prospects and our customers' needs are driving us to become more sophisticated. So, I see the marketplace is becoming uh, even more competitive. I think. Uh, I think there are a lot of solutions that are very good that are out there. And um, I think that organizations such as ourselves, such as Blue Ridge, are going to be looking for uh, those key things that are going to differentiate us from, uh, from the competition. You know, you heard me mention earlier about Lifeline. That, that's one of the differentiators that that we have is we've kind of personalized the whole um, automation. We, we, we work very, very closely with the customers on a regular basis, really reviewing, using that big data, reviewing their data, reviewing their inventory levels, uh, making suggestions proactively on uh, on maybe some changes that need to be made, some you know suggestions are made as far as strategies that should be employed, and it's it's that proactiveness with the uh, with the user and the organization that's driving that 
98% satisfaction that you looked at earlier on the on the um, on the website. Yeah, I find the whole thing very interesting. The the way the world is uh, well, the business is changing so much. I mean, I am old enough to remember, um, you know, nothing like this uh, used to exist, and yeah, now it's all about computing. And you've talked here. You mentioned earlier about ERPs, which uh, I think most uh, viewers uh, will know that it means enterprise resource. Um, and planning, isn't it? Uh, enterprises mm -hmm. are planning software, which yep. uh, uh, probably most serious companies, probably all serious companies use to manage their enterprise, their business. And um, these are some of the software, uh, ERP software uh, company suppliers, suppliers of, of ERPs. And you say that you have 40 ERP connectors. I mean, I mean, I, I find it really interesting that companies uh, can be so highly automated or softwareized that uh, everything can be done centrally in one office um, with uh, you know small group of computers and and a small a limited number of uh, software application. Very very large enterprises can be run. Does this mean? you know, we're in for a lot more job losses uh, gradually, or, or is this something that uh, might open up new areas of employment? Uh, I think that, I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I think that certainly, you know, as in any, any industry, um, as, as it evolves, efficiencies are going to come uh, into play, and there will be a you know, a reduction in certain, you know, um, areas of the workforce. But I think it's also going to be opening up um, areas. For example, the, um, the the whole idea of big data now um, is really driving the, um, the analytics that's being used um, throughout the supply chain. The fact that, um, you know, the data is in the cloud is is opening up the opportunity for us now to not to be confined or forced to go into that office. Um, I mean, and COVID was really a a driver of that. It forced a lot of organizations that um, that that weren't really too keen on decentralizing the workforce and allowing them to to actually work from home and and to get as much if not more done in a day than they could before so yeah i i think you know certainly there are going to be um there, there's going to be some areas that you're going to see a, a a drop in personnel but i i think as people are you know coming out of university with like i say degrees in supply chain and uh, optimization and forecasting and statistics i think these individuals are going to be coming bi a bigger and bigger part of uh of the supply chain organizations as they move forward and as they as they evolve yeah i think that's uh, uh as i say it's very interesting mainly because everything seems to be becoming more efficient um whether you're talking about supply chains or whether you're talking about for example building management so i think it's all about efficiency when i say building management i mean uh government and local authorities might uh, develop regulations to ask in, uh, buildings to be constructed that are more green more environmentally friendly but i think there's a lot more potential in making existing buildings and businesses more efficient uh, uh, whether it's uh, sticking solar panels on the roofs or uh, uh, making the windows more um, uh, capable of collecting solar energy or, or something i mean the if it, um, uh, it's probably a bad example but the the reason i thought of it is because the efficiency gained or uh, the use of something that already exists uh, in a better way is, is what the same, you know, is, is, is similar here. You've got lots of businesses that have supply chains, 
uh, that are managed uh, in a certain way it works for them as you said uh, but with this kind of software you're going to be able to manage them a lot better make them more efficient and get more out of the business so that, that's mm -hmm. uh, that's something that uh, is I can't see why companies wouldn't do it. I mean, on, on your website earlier, I noticed it said zero failed implementations. I don't know where it is. But what is the return on investment on things like the, uh, your software? I mean, how do you, how do you, do you calculate that even? Or I imagine that every business, is, every, every business that integrates this kind of software does become more efficient anyway, you know. I don't know if that's true, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't see how it would fail to make them more efficient. I think, you know, every, well, certainly every prospect that, that we work with in, in our, um, in our desire to, to make them a customer, one of the things that we do provide to them is um, an ROI analysis. And it is going to be different for every organization. Um, some organizations are are going to be you know very good in some areas and they need an improvement in others and and the efficiencies maybe aren't aren't you know quite as as obvious um but in every case where you're looking at an roi um in terms of i think um time of implementation i think what we have found is that our customers are able to achieve a hundred percent ROI um, in less than six months of implementing the solution. Um, the numbers are quite staggering. They're they're quite large. Very interesting. Mm, very compelling, actually. All right. Uh, so, um, Sven, if I, if you don't mind me asking about your second name, Anuapu, uh, Anu Anu. And Anapu, well, yeah. it sounds almost Indian, actually, but you don't look Indian from your LinkedIn picture. No, 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 and you know, I've, 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 I've been told it's it's Hawaiian, and so when people first hear the name, they get they get very happy. They think they're going to meet a um, a, a, a Hawaiian ski instructor, and then they're very disappointed when they meet me. <laughs> Sure it's uh true. it's uh the, the you know the first name Sven is is uh is a family name um from my mother's side and the last name is actually Estonian. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, that uh, makes sense. I'm not an expert on Estonian names, but uh, it kind of makes <laughs> neither, sense. Neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Is there anything that I didn't ask about that you want to talk about or mention? Uh, I think you were uh, very adept. I think great questions. I mean, I love the fact that we went in and we talked about, you know, really big data and the impact, and that was really a, you know, a driving force. Um, I, I think you're very astute um, in recognizing that um, it is this, improvement in in computers and computer processing that really has enabled us to go ahead and move forward. Um, I, I do want to go ahead and say that there's one element that we really didn't talk about, and that's my fault. And that is with all of the automation that is that's coming out um, and with all the advances in forecasting, um, one of the things that doesn't exist yet, and I don't anticipate it's going to come into existence anytime in the near future, is a, a crystal ball forecasting methodology where we are going to be able to predict, you know, with precise 100% accuracy what the consumer needs are going to be. That is always going to be a guessing game. We can only try to get better and better at it. Because of that, um, what I would say to any organization that is looking to go ahead and improve their, their inventory optimization is don't just look at the bells and the whistles and the new forecasts and the neat things that are being, uh, that are being bring, brought forward with AI. 
but also make sure that you have a solution that is going to um, help you to identify those exceptions that really are happening outside of the world of our, our artificial intelligence, because we need to be able to react to that as well. Um, so that's just kind of a, a leaving a, 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 a piece of uh, information I would leave you with. Okay. All right, well, Sven, uh, thank you very much for your time and your insight. Uh, great interview. Uh, have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye now. Send us an email at sales at roboticsandautomationnews.com to register for one of our many upcoming webinars. And if you'd like us to host your webinar, we have a range of options, including long-term lead generation packages and marketing campaigns. We look forward to hearing from you soon.